This is Record Bases and Occlusion Rims, Part 1. It is the rules concerning the mandibular record base made out of a thermoplastic material called Easy Tray. Be sure to cover Part 2, which is about the maxillary tray. Why exactly are we learning to make record bases? When you take two diagnostic casts on a patient and you can't hand articulate them and have us know exactly where the bite is and have those two casts remain stable while we try to mount them, then we have to make record bases to assist us in the mounting of the case. That's why we're learning how to make record bases. Many of your patients will fall into that category. There are certain characteristics of an ideal diagnostic cast. You must have casts with accurate anatomy recorded, plus a well-defined land area. Casts should be poured, at least ideally, with vacuum-spatted stone and at least the first pour that is free of voids, blebs, and holes. Base thickness is one-half to three-quarters of an inch at its thinnest point in the posterior, and a one-eighth to one-quarter inch land area should exist on the cast. It should be undercut free in the indexes that are recorded in the base in the form of a cross that extends from one side of the cast to the other. They are about two millimeters to three millimeters deep. Our end result should be a mounted case that is neat, clean, and accurately depicts the two dental arches and the occlusion of the patient. It will be used as a tool to educate him as to your treatment plan. The bases are going to be used for jaw relation records, and they should be made of an accurate material. We will make ours out of triad on the maxillary arch and a thermoplastic acrylic resin called Easy Tray on the mandible. They must have maximum contact with the supporting tissues for stability. They are designed to prevent movement of the record base in an anterior, posterior, and a lateral direction when the registration is made. Therefore, there is no relief for the record base except in the areas where the record base will be placed and undercuts exist on the teeth. We do not want to trap the record base on the cast. They must be aesthetic and pleasant for the patient to wear. You don't want to see any sharp spots or any sharp angles or edges that would cause injury to the patient. There are various materials that record bases and occlusion rims can be made from, and we're trying to give you a couple different experiences. They can be made of acrylic resin, which is the combination of a liquid and a powder that, when uh, mixed, will automatically set up with time. The shellac, which is a thermoplastic material. Triad, which is a composite light-cured material. Eclipse, which is a thermoplastic light-cured material made at a, at a um, laboratory. The cast metal base, which is fabricated at the laboratory and the other one that we're going to use which is easy tray which is a thermoplastic material that can be heated up and then cooled with cool water. We'll discuss some of the qualities of triad true tray which is a light cured composite material. First of all it's very easy to fabricate in the office so that's a plus. Its initial equipment cost is rather expensive so um, when you start out an office, you may not have enough money to actually jump in with one of these. The material warps during the curing with the light, and that's a negative part of it. And the material is very brittle and may break if, if it's into an undercut, or it may break a tooth off also. In its one advantage over the auto-cure acrylic resin that we have used in the past is a lack of really noxious fumes and a, a substance that isn't very good as far as biocompatibility. It's reasonably priced compared to sending a laboratory, uh, sending it to the laboratory to have them fabricated, and it's used for a variety of office surfaces once you make that initial investment. Some of the qualities of the thermoplastic acrylic resin that we are going to use called Easy Tray 
are the following. It's relatively easy to fabricate in the office, but there is a learning curve. You'll, you'll see the first time you try to make this. There's no initial cost for equipment, but I'm assuming that you already have a water bath or some type of a pot in which to heat water. The material warps during curing, and you do have to be careful and keep it in place and keep it on the cast so that it doesn't warp on you. you it does not break as easily when it's caught into an undercut because there's some flexibility to the acrylic resin. It can still break off a tooth, but if you can't remove it from the cast, you can put it back into the water and then not run the risk of breaking that tooth off. Doesn't have any noxious fumes or uh, materials that are considered carcinogenic in it, like the acrylic resin, the auto cure. It's reasonably priced compared to having laboratory base plates made, and it's used in a variety of services in the office. Another nice thing is there's no waste to this material. If you don't like your product, you simply put it back in the water bath and start over again when the material is soft. Here is some of the armamentarium needed for this particular project. You need a water bath, a handout torch with alcohol, a Bunsen burner to melt the wax, matches or a lighter, a paper cup with water in it, a little cup with Vaseline in it, a small amount to lubricate the cast, a surveyor, two pieces of base plate wax and one piece of sticky wax, an easy tray shape, the mandibular one, one trope triad true tray, a millimeter ruler or perio probe, a slow speed hand piece, your acrylic burrs, a hot plate, a number 11 and number 7 spatula, a barred parker handle with blade, a hot plate to adjust the wax, and scissors to cut the material. What you need to work on on this project is your diagnostic cast that you made from your two deniforms. First thing we want to do is get that water bath started so the, the material will be ready when we're ready to work. Uh, there's a paper towel wrapped around a little framework in the water bath and if it isn't there, make sure you put a paper toweling around that framework and place it in the bottom of the water bath. Place the water in the pan up to the little mark that is shown on the arrow above. Turn the water bath on and set the desired temperature to 175 degrees. Then place your easy tray into the water bath and make sure it's sitting on the little paper towel. The first thing that we want to do is to determine the path of insertion and removal for our record base. We will tilt the cast to the anterior and to the posterior to equalize as much as possible the undercuts on the guide plane areas that are on the abutment teeth next to the edentulous areas. We will then have to place small amounts of undercut wax to block out the areas to keep our record base from getting stuck in the undercuts on the cast. Next, we will tilt the cast to the buckle and to the lingual to equalize the lingual undercuts. We will do this until we have chosen the best path of insertion and removal of our record base. This is the path of draw for the record base. We do not want to create a base plate that's going to get locked into the undercuts below the uh, height of contour of the teeth and rip the teeth off the cast when we're finished with our base plate. So we're going to use the dental surveyor that we have and I want you to put the wax carver, which is the instrument by the arrow, and place it into the vertical rod of the surveyor. The first thing that you may want to do is to survey your cast at that path of draw so that the heights of contour are evident for you to use when you're blocking out the undercuts on the cast. Next, draw the outline of the record base so that you can see where your final record base will be on the cast and it will point out some of the critical areas of blockout. Now take base plate wax and add enough to eliminate the undercuts, but don't overdo it. Block out guide plane areas and lingual surfaces below the survey lines on the teeth. Any area where the base plate will cross is important for blockout. When you prepare the base plate, the facial surfaces of the abutment teeth 
are likely to have base plate get into those areas as you work the materials. This area, signified by the arrows, if not blocked out sufficiently, may cause the base plate to break off a tooth as you attempt to remove it from the cast. Place the wax carver into the vertical rod of the surveyor and use it to trim the excess block out away. This prepares the surface parallel to the path of insertion and removal and will make your final base plate very stable. You want the base plate to rest above the survey line on the support area of the teeth, not on the wax when you construct it. Take care not to cut off the stone surface of the teeth as you are carving the wax away. Otherwise, the base plate will fit on your cast, but will not seat on the deniform, which is your patient. You need to block out the embrasures in the anterior. Do not overblock them out, as you want the acrylic to go into the embrasures for stability. You want the acrylic to be confluent with the tooth surface. You do not want the base plate to rest above the teeth and create a ledge. The picture on the upper left is overblocked out. The two pictures on the lower are properly blocked out. This is achieved with the pointed end of the number 7 spatula. Here are some examples of block out and the effect on the final record base. The upper picture has too much block out in the anteriors. The base plate stands above the teeth with a little ledge along the edge. Do not over block out the areas as you want the acrylic to go into the embrasures for stability. You want the acrylic to be confluent with the teeth as shown in the lower picture and you ideally want the embrasure spaces to be closed with the base plate. These record bases were made on too much block out or the person placed the triad or acrylic on the wax and not touching the tooth. A third possibility for this error is that the base plate was over trimmed. This produces a base plate that can move anterior posteriorly and left and right. It is not stable. When a patient occludes, the rim can move, which will produce an inaccurate jaw registration for mounting the case. This record base demonstrates good adaptation of the base plate to the teeth and cast. The blockout was kept to a minimum. The base was built above the wax blockout, hugging the teeth and filling the embrasures. Here's a close-up of the blockout that should be placed around the facial to prevent the tooth from being broken off when the base plate is removed from the cast. That material has a tendency to work its way around and get caught into an undercut. You see here a close-up view of the wax carver removing the blockout wax parallel to the path of insertion on both the lingual surfaces and the surfaces next to the edentulous areas where the flange and wax rims will be. It is carefully removed without removing any stone from the cast. Remember the wax carver should remove the wax from any area where the acrylic resin base crosses. Base plates should cover a wide area of the arch for stability and support. There's really no set rule for design, but you have to think about where the base plate should touch to prevent movement in an anterior and posterior direction and also in a lateral direction. On an extension base side, it should cover the retromolar pad and extend into the retromylohyde fossa for retention. They should not move when taking a jaw registration. Place the design on the cast with a permanent marker not with a lead pencil because it will get into the record base material when you're making it, giving it a real dirty finish. Soak the cast before beginning the record base with thermoplastic material. You may place a very thin layer of Vaseline on the cast for a separating medium, but it really isn't necessary if you keep the cast wet. The material that we are going to use on the mandible is called Easy Tray. It gets soft at approximately 170 degrees. The water bath should be set at 175. Be sure to use the thermometers to assure that the right temperature is in the water. Some of them are a little old. Check the material for softness using a large spatula that you have. Remove the tray material when it's soft from the water bath using the large spatula to bring it to the top of the water as the water is quite warm. The material will not be hot to the touch. The first step is to cut the material to make a mandibular form by cutting the material 
from the wide end forward as shown in the picture. Begin to adapt the material to the cast. Push it down on the lingual of the anteriors first and then spread it um, widely to cover the posterior areas over the ridges and adapt it to the cast. The material will get stiff rather rapidly, so you must work quickly. If the material gets too stiff, remove it from the cast, don't straighten it out, place it in the water bath for a few seconds, remove it and continue. Finally, when you get that form adapted, remove it from the cast. Press the resin against the cast and you will start to see the outline of the cast on the material to help guide you in trimming it with the scissors to fit the cast. You must get the form correct on the cast. Thickness and length should be achieved on the cast as trimming this material with burrs and a lathe is more difficult than an auto cure resin or triad. This material can go from soft to set as many times as you wish. There's a learning curve with this material. Once you get used to it, you may like it. Right now, it will be more time consuming and will require your patience while you learn to work with this new material. Do not try to get the exact outline form the first time you take a scissors to it. Get the bulk of the excess off on the first cut, then refine it with additional water bath heating and the scissors or a Barb Parker blade in a lab handle. When you remove it, you will see the outline of the cast. Use that outline to trim the material. I suggest you work on one area at a time as the material hardens to where you cannot easily trim it with your scissors. Don't try to trim the hard material. You'll ruin your scissors and it just doesn't work. I worked on the lingual first and I really only reheated the lingual part that I was actually trying to cut. That makes it easier to have something to hold and put it back in the water bath for a few seconds. This is the first time that I use this material, so my slides will re reflect some of the difficulties that you're going to have. I experimented with various ways to trim the material. The scissors was best for the flange areas, but I used the Bard Parker handle and blade for the lingual plating area. This shows some progress on the lingual as I have trimmed away the excess material and adapted it to the cast. One nice aspect is that you can get a really nice roll on the lingual folds as you adapt this material into that fold. If you have sharp edges that will cut the patient, you can even add material to material and work it to where you don't even see that line between the two materials. Press it and adapt it closely to the cast. Do not allow overextension like you see on the right of the picture. You may trim the material with a Bard Parker blade when you get to the point of trying to get it closer to your outline form. You have to trim rapidly or you will have to replace it into the water bath for a few seconds. You have to get all the way through the material with your cut or it will string as you try to remove your cut piece. No problem though, you can work it out by placing it back into the water bath and heat it again. I don't think the Bard Parker blade is the best way to trim the base plate on a master cast as you may cut the surfaces of your cast making the base plate. I would use the scissors alone to do the trimming for a base plate. The company makes a thinner material for base plates, but I found that my base plate was too thin and flexible when I used it. I like the rigidity that I got from the thicker material. I heated the Bard Parker blade to use it in cutting the material, and it worked, but if the material is left on the blade and you place it back into the flame, it will burn the material left on the blade, and when you cut again, you will get the blackening seen in the bottom picture. It will also occur if your flame burns yellow instead of blue. Yellow flame deposits carbon onto your instrument. You will then have a dirty area on the base plate that's shown in the bottom picture. The good news is that you can reheat the material and cut this off. We're approaching the final form. This base plate needs to be reheated and thinned to approximately two to three millimeters in the posterior lingual areas. It will not trim well on the lathe or with a hand piece. It is easy to achieve this by reheating and pushing the excess material posteriorly and then trim it with the scissors or blade. 
At the final stages, place the cast with the resin on it back into the water bath to finish the edges. This needs to be trimmed to come back down and stay within the confines of the two abutment teeth, not to extend in front of the tooth as shown by the arrow. This may contribute to the fracture of a tooth upon removal of the base plate. Remember, dirty fingers will translate to a dirty resin. Allow the material to cool to final form when you're done working with it. You may place it in the cool water to allow it to set more rapidly. Keep pressing on it to keep it adapted well to the cast as it goes through some shrinkage as it cools. Do not cool the base plate by placing the base plate only in cold water. Keep it on the cast. It's less likely to distort by your holding the material up against the cast to counteract shrinkage of the base plate away from the cast as it cools. Keep the base plate on the cast at all times when you're storing it to prevent warpage. Pictured here is an auto cure acrylic resin material. We do not use it because of the extreme amount of noxious fumes experienced by the entire school when we do use it and its carcinogenic chemicals. It has some of the same characteristics as a thermoplastic material but you must totally get the material formed in six to eight minutes when it sets permanently and does not allow you to rework the material. We can use it in our examples for the rest of the project though. Carefully try to remove the base plate from the cast. Do not force it. You can break off teeth. An advantage of our material is that we can put it back into the water bath to free up the areas caught into an undercut. The autocure resin must be cut off the cast. If it will not come off, use the water bath to soften and prevent breakage of your teeth. The base plate specifications are as follows. It must have rounded corners and rounded edges so as to not injure the patient's tissues. The flanges extend down to within two millimeters of the depth of the vestibule on a diagnostic cast. That cast is often overextended and you don't want to have to remove the length of your base plate when you take it to the mouth, so you're giving yourself a couple of millimeters of leeway space. On the master cast though, it must extend to the entire depth of the vestibule as this cast should reflect the actual depth of the patient's vestibular fold. The flange should be a minimum thickness in the areas where teeth are to be set. You don't want to have any interference when you go to setting a tooth in its proper position. It should also be positioned so as to not interfere with a posing occlusion. Remember that the maxillary lingual cusp and the mandibular buccal cusp are the most common cusp to occlude with the opposing arch. As far as specifications for the wax rim, the wax extends down to within two millimeters of the depth of the base plate flange. It extends down the lingual surface also to counteract lateral movement caused by occlusal forces. The wax is four to six millimeters wide in the anterior and eight to 10 millimeters in the posterior. It mimics the width of the tooth next to it. Premolars and molars are approximately eight to 10 millimeters in width. In the posterior areas, the wax should converge toward the occlusal to prevent dislodgement by the cheeks and tongue under function. The labial contour of the anterior wax rim should follow the contour of the arch form and the residual teeth and the occlusion of the opposing arch. With a slow speed handpiece, remove any overly thick areas or sharp areas on the edges of the record base flanges. The deep cut acrylic resin burr is best for gross removal. The other one that has less prominent ridges is good to remove the little string tags that will form as you cut this material. Do not remove the pointed areas that go into the embrasure spaces. You want those areas closed, but you can dull the pointed edges. You can place retention into the record base at the time you are forming the easy tray flange shape. When you heat the areas, use a wax spatula and make dents into the buccal and lingual surfaces of the flange so that the wax locks onto the flange on both sides of it. 
If you have not done this at the time of construction, you may reheat the area and make the indentations into the flange, or you can cut them into the flange with a number 8 or 10 round burr. This will provide mechanical retention for the wax to the dental flange. After the base plate is complete, be sure you clean it with soap and water. In addition to the mechanical retention, you should add sticky wax to the flange area and to the lingual base plate before adding the rims to the base plates. Using a Bunsen burner, heat one piece of base plate wax along the long side until it is molten and slowly fold it like an accordion upon itself to form a rim of wax that can be used for the occlusion rim. The wax may be repeatedly heated to assure that the surface of the wax is molten when you make the folds of the wax. You have to have good bonding between those pieces as you place them together. You may have to use an additional half piece of wax to get enough height to form an occlusion rim. The desired height of the rim, if you have teeth, would be to the height of the existing teeth. After your block of wax is formed, cut pieces equal to the size of each edentulous area. Heat the pieces of the base plate wax and the sticky wax with a handout torch and adhere them together to form the record base occlusion rim. Additional wax must be added to the sides of the rim down to two millimeters above the bottom of the flange. You will use that leftover piece of wax and the 31 spatula to do this task. Use the hot plate to adjust the height of the rim to the level of the occlusal plane of the other remaining teeth. The posterior of the rim will be approximately two-thirds the way up retromolar pad for the most ideal occlusal plane on the mandible. The number 31 spatula will help you contour the sides of the rims. They should converge to the occlusal so that the cheeks and the tongue hold the rim in place when the muscles flex. The wax in the anterior should follow the contour of the lingual surfaces of the adjacent teeth. The width of the rim is about four to six millimeters. The buckle should mimic the contour of the arch and of the facial surfaces of any remaining teeth. It should slope on the lingual to become confluent with the palate. Using the number 31 wax spatula, contour the buckle surfaces of the rims to follow the height of contour of the adjacent abutment teeth. The wax should extend cervically to approximately two to three millimeters from the bottom of the flange. The wax rim should converge to the occlusal while you're working with the warm wax, keep the base plate on the cast so that you don't run the risk of allowing the base plate to heat up and warp or distort slightly. The number 31 spatula works great to form the rims. I really like this instrument. After I've completed the rims, I do the following. I first take a Bard Parker blade and trim the wax away from the flange up to about two to three millimeters above the bottom of the flange. I then use a Hanau torch to smooth the edges of the cut wax. I then run the rim under cool water and with a wet 2x2 two two gauze, I shine the surfaces of the wax rims. When you use the Hanau torch, keep it at a distance from the wax where you don't cause the wax to run and drip down the sides. You gently sweep the flame over the surface of the wax as you pump air into the torch. The wax becomes somewhat shiny and then as it cools it gets a duller smooth surface. This is something you just have to learn by doing it. If your flame is not shooting forward and staying out there a period of time, check to see if the screw shown at the arrow is tight. You can regulate how far the flame shoots out by regulating this screw. Here are some specs for the final construction of the occlusion rim. The height should be at the level of the other remaining teeth. In the posterior area, 
If there are no teeth present, it should be half to two-thirds of the way up the retromolar pad. The width of the rims in the posterior is 8 to 10 millimeters wide at the occlusal, or it also simulates any natural tooth that is present. The anterior is 4 to 6 millimeters wide. The shape of the rims should converge to the occlusal, and extensions of wax should go to about 2 millimeters from the vestibular limit of the flange. Other specifications for the record base include all the edges should be rounded and smooth. No sharp 90 degree blunt edges should be exposed. All aspects of the design should be rounded and follow the musculature to within two millimeters of the depth of the vestibule. The embrasure areas will be the only ones that remain that have sharp areas. It should be free of voids on both sides of it. The height of the wax rim should extend upward to the height of the natural teeth in anterior and posterior to it. If there are no posterior teeth, then the wax rim should go half to two-thirds of the way up the retromolar pad. Here's a very nice occlusion rim for your viewing. The only thing that I can see that might not be perfect on this is that the wax rim on the edentulous side is a little bit too wide. This occlusion rim demonstrates how the wax should look in that it converges to the occlusal from a broad base which is attached to the record base. Here's a summary of all the things we've discussed as far as the specs for a mandibular occlusion rim. Label your cast on the posterior surface as it sits on the desktop. Label the record base also because they sometimes get separated from the cast. Be sure to clean off the block out wax from your cast before you turn it in and turn it in to the boxes that are labeled for your unit lab.